Bright Memory and Bright Memory Infinite are quite ambitious games for a single developer. Yes, you heard that right. This was made by a single person in their off time. Reading the Wikipedia for Bright Memory Infinite, it describes it as a remake of the first game, but that simply is not true. The only connection between Bright Memory and Bright Memory Infinite is the main character you are playing as. The story is completely separate, the gameplay is totally new, and the graphics have been updated. And while the first game is rather short, I do think this means it's worth covering the first game as its own separate entity. Because although Infinite is is a significant improvement over the first game, I do think the first game does do some things better than the second. But for now, let's just focus on the original Bright Memory. Hey, Derek here, and lately we've been seeing a lot of first person shooters inspired by Devil May Cry. And I'm not complaining, I think that combination works incredibly well, and I've always liked Devil May Cry anyway. Yeah, the combat is definitely the strength of this game, but I need to talk about the story and graphics before I can get there. Graphically, this game is actually quite impressive, if I remind you it's made by a singular person. The dev wanted the rival AAA games, and in assets I think they do that well, but in execution, it's a bit lacking. Now, don't get me wrong, at a glance this game looks great. Vistas, post-processing, textures, all that stuff lines up. But the finer details are a bit lacking and a little jank in an almost charming way. But I'll get to that when I talk about the story. As far as the PC release, it has all the options you would expect, including some NVIDIA options, which I love to see. Ray tracing is fantastic here. Lighting is definitely one of this game's strong suits. Although I found that DirectX 12 really doesn't run well. My frame rate didn't seem to dip, but it felt like I was moving my mouse through molasses. It was just very hard to aim. The game tend to stutter, so DX12 didn't work well on my 3080, but that's generally been my experience with my 3080 or almost any game that has DX12 anyway. So I don't really know if that's the game's fault, my GPU's fault, or DX12's fault. However, there is one thing this game leaves out that is really baffling to me. You can't rebind your keys, and that's unacceptable. Especially for a game like this that's partly hack and slash, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to rebind your keys. Now, there's nothing wild about the default control scheme. You're not gonna have to reach across the keyboard and press enter mid-combat or something, but obviously this is kind of unacceptable. Now, I can sit here and complain, but in the grand scheme, this is pretty technologically impressive because again, I have to lower my expectations. This is made by a single person in their spare time, as I've said before. Most likely they were struggling with something since it says that key rebinding will eventually come to the game. It never did, so they probably ran into a brick wall and then eventually gave up. Yeah, no idea what's going on here. Anyway, let's move on to the story. That's how Steam describes the story. You won't pick up on any of that while you're playing the game. The story makes no sense. Even though this game was made in the Unreal Engine, the best way I can describe the cutscenes and the way the story is delivered to you is like a poorly English dubbed anime shoved into a Unity asset flip. Just a special ID card. Nothing else that I can see. Roger that. I'm on I don't my way. Care who it is. Keep in touch. The light in the room reacted to my device. The reaction is growing more and more intense. Is this the lost forest the doctor mentioned? Huh? No way. Long time no see, Shelly. Carter, why are you... I advise you to stay out of this matter. Wake was as stubborn as you are. What the hell happened here? <laughs> It's almost half endearing, half cringy how bad this is, but at least it is entertaining. The story is so unimportant that I don't want to explain more. If you're curious, you can read the Steam page about it. It will tell you more than playing the game. What I will say is that since the dev is based over in China, a lot of this game is based off Chinese mythology, and I'm totally down with that. It makes for a really interesting setting with some very interesting enemies. The best way I can describe the gameplay is a mixture of Shadow Warrior and Devil May Cry. For the first-person shooter side, you get three weapons. They're all 
pretty generic. You get an assault rifle that assault rifles, you get a shotgun that shotguns, and you get a pistol that useless is. Okay, it's not entirely useless. You can tack on a little bit of extra damage if you really want to, but you're pretty much never gonna use it. And yeah, all these weapons handle exactly as you would expect them to. There's not really any surprises here. The movement feels somewhat similar to the advanced movement Call of Duty games with a twist. You can walk and you would sprint like you would expect, but this is where I start complaining about the controls. The controls mostly work, but there's too many things bound to the same buttons. For example, if you want to sprint, you press shift, but if you want to boost to the sides or backward, you have to press shift in that direction. A, this means you can't boost forward, and B, this means occasionally you just don't get the boost that you want. The next really big complaint to have is with jumping. In order to double jump, you would think you would double jump like anything else. You press the jump button and then you press it again. That doesn't work in this game. It's only really a long jump or a high jump. You just hold down the jump button. Why? This is really unintuitive. Having to hold down the jump button in the middle of combat is also extra annoying. I would have much preferred it to just have a traditional double jump. And that's exactly what the sequel did. I guess hindsight is 2020. Now that I think about that, now that we're past the year 2020, that saying can have numerous meanings. Anyway, the movement is serviceable and does what it's supposed to. I just have a few grievances with it. But where this game is different from the others is with your skills. If you look in the bottom left, you have a bunch of skills all on their own cooldown. Throughout the course of the game, you will get more experience, which allows you to unlock more skills. I would highly recommend you unlock something that lets you get more experience right away for obvious reasons. Anyway, these skills Skills are things like an EMP, which will stun enemies and lock them in place in the air. Another ability is your trusty light sword. Release a furious swings and then you also have the option to light slash or heavy slash doing a shockwave attack on the ground. These skills can be upgraded. For example, the EMP can be upgraded to freeze time for anyone trapped inside. Your light sword can be upgraded to be a projectile. And if you look down there, there's many more abilities. This allows you to have quite a bit of player expression, especially since each skill is on its own cooldown. You are highly encouraged to see how you can combine each skill to do as much damage as possible in the shortest amount of time as possible. And it is very rewarding. For example, you may start by using a skill that will allow you to do extra DPS for a short amount of time. This will stun enemies and launch them into the air. Then you freeze them in place with your EMP. Then you release a bubble, which will just do damage to everyone inside. Then you do your light sword attack, and this should obliterate anything in the game, short of bosses. There's also a style ranking, so you can really see the influence Devil May Cry had on this game, and I'm all for it. Although, again, I will complain about the controls. In order to use the skill that lets you do more damage for a short period of time, you have to press Q and E at the same time, which are also buttons that will do other skills. It's very easy to accidentally do one of those skills instead, which is really frustrating. Just let me rebind the controls. Anyway, as for the enemies themselves, they're quite varied, which is impressive because the game is rather short. You have a combination of your basic melee enemies to flying enemies to normal Call of Duty style enemies to mini bosses to regular bosses. They all have their different attack patterns to learn how to dodge, just like Dark Souls. This time I can say that unironically because there's a blatant Dark Souls reference in this game. Anyway, the bosses for me are by far the most fun, mostly. The last boss kind of sucks, gonna be honest. He's got a, this isn't even my final form, except for a second form is the same as the first, except for now there's stage hazards that get in the way and can block your movement, which is highly annoying. If you get an upgrade that allows you to float in the air while you're attacking, this boss becomes significantly easier, but it feels more annoying than enjoyable. And vast majority of my deaths were just because this arena is rather small and the things that shoot fire at me get in the way and stop me from moving. So yeah, that could have been done better. Other than that, that's basically the whole combat system. It's rewarding, but again, the game is very short. You can beat it in 30 to 40 minutes. Even the story abruptly ends the whole time you're chasing this wyvern and you never actually catch up to it or see it in person or fight it or do anything with it. And you never see it in the sequel either. So wh why is this here? At least let me see it. To be honest, this whole game feels like a proof of concept. It's very janky and rough around the edges. The only place it exceeds my expectations was in the combat. But there is something to be said there. I found myself having a good amount of fun just trying to combine all of the skills to do as much damage as I possibly could. The developer also seemed to understand that if you have constant combat, you might get a bit burnt out. So they tried to add in something to change the pace. 
Unfortunately, these are the worst parts of the game. One of them is a puzzle that just requires you rotating stones to line up the emblems, and this is just very boring. You just have to figure out what emblem lines up with what and do it in the correct order so that it doesn't keep rotating the circles, and uh, this isn't even fun or clever, it's just wasting my time. I'll never get those two minutes back, yeah, I know, it's a big waste. The next one is a platforming puzzle, which is just a mild inconvenience, really. It doesn't matter too much. I wouldn't even mention this if the game wasn't so short. The game is only 30 to 40 minutes minutes long, you're not getting burnt out by having 30-40 minutes of combat. So, in final conclusion, would I recommend this game? Well, if you're curious about it, I would. It's not terribly expensive, and it's interesting in its own right. It definitely has its own charm in a poorly dubbed anime kind of way. It's also kind of cringy in that way too. But if that's your thing, I mean, go ham. Big thanks to all my Twitch subscribers. Those are those names scrolling at the top of your screen there. If you subscribe to my Twitch, you get to see my videos ahead of time. And of course, a big thanks goes to all of you for watching this video.